it's seven o'clock now. So hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's Architectural Digital Futures talking event about augmented reality and intelligent construction. This is the first session of this topic and the fifth session of the overall event this semester. I'm Hanning Liu from Tongji University, and I'm very happy to host today's talking event. And before we start, I would like to offer everyone a few reminders. This is a double live meeting. So we have right now a Zoom call going on, and this call is also being live streamed right now on uh, YouTube and Bilibili. So uh, those of you here in the Zoom call, if you do, do not wish your image to be broadcasted to the live, please make sure that you keep your camera off. And uh, our speaking event is divided into two parts. Firstly, I will introduce our keynote speakers, and then uh, they will deliver their wonderful lectures. Following that, our panelists will ask questions or provide comments one by one. Additionally, our audience, uh, whether here on Zoom call or from YouTube and Bilibili, is welcome to share comments or questions, uh, which I will then forward to our keynote speakers. So now I'm going to introduce our keynote speakers in the presentation order. Firstly, we have three scholars from Professor Christopher Corolla's team at the University of Hong Kong. And our first speaker, Gavin Gobel, is a designer and researcher specialized in the field of combining augmented reality with generative architecture. He is currently holding a position as postdoctoral fellow and lecturers at the University of Hong Kong. He has gained academic research experience at the Block Research Group in 2021 and at the DSL since 2019. His research advances uh, studies in collaborative holographic driven construction, expands opportunities for technology infused craftsmanship, and reflects on workflows that replace conventional paper drawing based. Uh, communication with holographic instruction. Our second speaker, Jingwen Song, is a senior research assistant specializing in robotic fabrication who joined VSAL in 2022. She received a Bachelor of Architecture from Jiangsu University in 2017 and a Master of Architecture from Shandong Jianzhu University in 2021. She graduated with a Master of Science and in Digital and Material Technologies at the University of Michigan Tubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning in 2022, where her work focused on robotic timber assembly and textile structure design. Our third speaker, Abdul Sheikh, is a senior uh, research assistant specializing in extended reality interaction and uh, he joined the BSL in 2021. He graduated with BA honors from the Bachelor of Architecture at the Oxford Brooks University School of Architecture in 2019. Following this, he worked as architectural assistant at architectural design practice uh, in London, UK. He completed a Master of Robotics and Advanced Construction at the IAAC in 2021, where his thesis project focused on human-machine collaboration and the integration of robotic fabrication and extended reality in architectural material systems. The last speaker is Alexander Tedrow, who is a researcher with a background in mixed reality, digital fabrication, robotics, biomaterials, deployable structures, digital twins, simulation, machine learning, and computer vision. He is interested in the integration of computation and uh, emerging technology for human-machine collaboration in design, visualization, and fabrication. Currently, he is pursuing a graduate degree at MIT. He completed his Bachelor of Architectural degree from Cornell University, where he also 
uh, received a minor in computer science and information science. He has many papers published on CDRF, ECAD, Arcadia, and automation in construction. So without further ado, as uh, Garvin is currently on a business trip, so Alex, Alexander, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, uh, so can you uh, share your screen and uh, deliver your lecture firstly? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, give me a second. Uh, okay. <laughs> I have to pull up my script first, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. It's seven o'clock now in uh, America. Yeah, it's in the morning. Uh, <laughs> still opening my laptop and my files and looking for the script that I have uh, prepared. Thank you for joining us. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Um, uh, yes, I can see. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, okay, so my name is Alexander Tetjo, and I'm excited to be presenting in the Digital Futures Forum on Augmented Reality and Intelligent Construction, focusing on uh, my my talk today will focus on human-machine material collaboration through augmented assemblies. So a uh, little bit about me is that I'm currently a graduate student at MIT, uh, and I'm pursuing a dual degree in architecture and computer science, and I just graduated from Cornell, where I also study uh, architecture and computer science. Um, previously um, worked at um, a variety of like scales, including like robotics, material to environmental scales, and also worked as like a computational designer at SOM and also Jenny Sabin, and also worked together with Hologram as a researcher. Um, my previous, um, so today I'll be focusing on the three specific project that centers around the idea of human machine material interaction. And the first paper that I'll talk with kind of deals with uh, the precision and accuracy of the technology. Previously, the accuracy of AR is not is limited, limiting on the kind of applications we can use it for. And in this paper, we will investigate methods to not only improve the accuracy of AR, but also conduct a comprehensive precision study to understand what we're working with. And this paper is called Augmented Reality for High Precision Fabrication of Glue Laminated Timber Beams. It's published in Automation and Construction, and the paper is done in collaboration with Nick Will Cameron from Hologram and the Robotic Construction Lab with Sasha Sivkovich. Um, the manufacturing process of glue and beam is a complex process, typically starting with a digital model of the beam to create templates, which are then used in the lamination and fabrication process. And to mitigate these errors during fabrication, workers are required to align the plywood template to the entirety of the beam and make sure that the template doesn't move during the fabrication process. Uh, additionally, a unique set of template is required for every beam design and plywood templates are prone to temperature and moisture related expansion and shrinkage. Uh, as a result, uh, fabrication and human error are inevitable. Uh, however, current AR workflow using slam tracking alone to position virtual content are not accurate enough for high precision applications. And the goal of this study is to improve the accuracy and large scale for architectural fabrication by reducing drift errors. And the research uh, primarily investigate the use of multiple markers, specifically QR codes on glue land beam as additional key points in the environment to improve the alignment between the virtual, the physical, and then the headset. Uh, the framework of the research described the multiple method marker method, but also described the inner workings of the AR software called Twin Build. Um, using the Twin Build software, the primary thing that we did was basically to reduce the drift error through interpolation between multiple markers, but also rely more on the registration of the nearest marker in a Delaunay triangulation. 
uh, for the uh, precision study we conducted, we tested it first on a 10-foot curved blue land beam with multiple connection details. And in order to understand the effect of multiple marker placement, we tested varying marker arrangements. And the way the markers are arrangement, arranged is important because it changes two things. Uh, the distance between the marker and the glue lamp beam, and then the distance between the markers themselves. Um, and for each of these marker arrangements, we also test it with varying marker frequencies of 1, 2, 4, 6, and 8. And the study with one marker is conducted without any interpolation, just using phonogram. And our primary hypothesis is that if markers position if markers are positioned closer to the beam, then we will have a higher accuracy. And then our secondary hypothesis is that uh, if we increase the marker count, then the frequency will correlate with an increase in fabrication accuracy too. Uh, we started with this template method as a way of arranging markers uh, because that is the way that um, the conventional glue lamp manufacturers are using template to marker markup center points for fabrication and finishing. And we just put additional QR codes on top of it to kind of get the, to kind of align the AR projection. Um, and by using the outline of the beam as a guide, the plywood template can be like, man, like it still have to be aligned to the profile of the glue lamp beam. Um, in the next alignment method, we this is the frame alignment method, and the arrangement of the marker is not specific to the outline of the beam here anymore, but markers are placed around the perimeter of the glue lamp beam by constructing a bounding, um, bounding frame around the beam. And due to the modular nature of the frame, the components can be modified to account for multiple beam shapes and sizes. And the last uh, method that we investigated was the edge alignment, which is a strip that is made out of a thin film acetate and has intervals printed along it to indicate the location of the marker placement. Uh, the strip is attached to the beam along an edge using a masking tape, and then the marker are placed uh, of, on the edge of the beam following the indication of the strip. Uh, and yeah, there's a video of it here. And now going to like the results of our uh, of these studies, uh, we realized that the connection detail in the sample beam um, that we tested, uh, the, the, the arrangements of the cut go from left to right, and then starting with cut A and ending with drill K. And then for QR code marker of one, we realize that the further that we go from like the original point of where the QR code is, the higher the uh, deviation of it, uh, ranging from all the way from like six millimeters to 18 millimeters in the template alignment method. And then uh, even after we put like a secondary marker on the other side, we notice that, that this deviation immediately decreases by a lot. Um, and the primary thing that we also realize is that when comparing the deviation of the three alignment method in each marker frequency, uh, the edge alignment method performs the best, followed by the template alignment and then the frame alignment. Um, and because these different alignment methods have unique marker arrangements, um, unique marker arrangement with marker frequency of four, um, the distances between the marker are also different. So the primary uh, conclusion that we have was that the accuracy is actually uh, kind of uh, correlating with the, the distances between um, the QR codes. And yeah, this figure shows that. And our analysis also suggests that the use of more marker leads to uh, a decrease in deviation, but at a certain point, the frequency, at a certain point of like QR code frequency, the change in deviation become less significant. Um, and then we use this information to kind of inform how we test our methods in a more industrial setting. So previously it was conducted in a lab environment, but now we're moving to a factory environment where we tested this with a 14 foot long um, straight V straight beam um, and then this was for uh this beam was actually used for a high school in pennsylvania uh, it was part of that process 
Um, and then we also test it with this with a second beam test in a factory environment, which is a 40 foot long chamfered beam. Uh, and then this project was for a pavilion in Connecticut. Uh, this is how the accuracy retained as it moves across the entirety of the beam. And then the third beam we tested was the frame alignment method for quality control. Um, and then this was a twisted 24 foot long twisted beam for a bench at a New Hampshire. And with that being said, the development of the accuracy, the, the research demonstrate the accuracy of AR in large scale uh, cool and beam factor, uh, fabrication. And then uh, we demonstrate that uh, depending on like the location, frequency, and the size of these QR codes, the accuracy of the projection can actually be influenced. And we hope that other researchers can use this precision study to inform their projects and but understand the accuracy of AR and inspire new application by quantitatively uh, understanding the accuracy. But it's also important to note that the results we gather from these studies are in a somewhat controlled environment with proper headset calibration, good lighting, and without any moving parts of the background, which might not always be the same case in uh, on a construction site. And one of the applications that uh, we did was basic through, through this increased precision is basically we can achieve feedback-based fabrication processes, um, which is uh, uh, demonstrated in the CDRF conference paper title, Gesture Recognition for Feedback-Based Mixed Reality and Robotic Fabrication, a case study of the Unlogged Tower. Uh, this research is conducted in the Rural Urban Building Innovation Lab with Leslie Locke, and the unlocked tower is a 36-foot-tall timber structure uh, that repurposes dying trees and infested ash 3 in North America to create a lightweight timber structure by leveraging bending active kinematics, but also through robotic and mixed reality fabrication. Uh, all three methods focus on incorporating the user's tactile interaction with physical objects as a mean to generate digital information. Um, by using the near-depth sensing camera on the HoloLens, we are able to record the movement and gesture of the user's hands. And this is done through the articulated hand tracking to recognize the 25 3D joint positions in rotation, which includes the wrist knuckle, finger joint tips. And by doing so, we are able to get the joint configuration and orientation data to estimate hand gestures such as like pinching and tapping and through gesture recognition and touching of physical objects could generate, modify and update new digital information enabling seamless stimuli between the physical and the digital world. Um, as a result, the digital environment is generative of the user's provided interaction with physical environments. Uh, this this workflow is technic uh, broken down into three gesture-based mixed reality fabrication workflow, object localization, object identification, and object calibration. The first uh, method in here is object localization, uh, which primarily focused on human-robot collaboration with mixed reality. And then this is specifically used in the log mounting procedure. Um, uh, to determine the physical geometry and digital space, which was helpful, and also the cut geometry placement during the robotic curving process. Uh, for the lock mounting procedure, the user would um, the user would place three points um, at each end of the lock to create two individual circles and just generate a cylindrical mesh that represents the physical lock. Um, and then a point is generated when the user pinches and this feedback mechanism provides the user with visual confirmation of the digitization process. And using the generated cylindrical geometry, a cut plane is created to cut the log in half using a six axis robotic arm with a bandsaw and a factor. Uh, after the log half log is mounted and rotated, we could also locate the half log digitally by registering three points at both ends. When the geometry is defined, the location of the cut path can also be registered by placing a point on the log. Um, and then in this log mounting process, two points are used to determine the diameter and one point is used to uh, determine the opposite end of the length. 
And then additionally, the MR system provide ongoing feedback by providing a validation to determine whether the cut geometry falls within the bound of the log. And if the cut the geometry is out of the bound, it display a red uh, notation in the user interface. Um, and then based on this cut geometry, a true path is generated to curve the log using the robotic arm. And to sum up, the object localization allow users to simultaneously generate digital mesh that represent the physical log and locate work object during uh, ro robotic fabrication processes. Uh, the second framework that we developed was object identification. So in the second method, uh, this method is used to differentiate between self-similar physical components and display intuitive step-by-step -step assembly instructions. And this was helpful specifically in finger joint fabrication and tube steel identification. Um, so due to the geometric variation of the unlocked tower, the finger joint location in each panels are staggered between adjacent boards as illustrated in this um, diagram. The curve distances actually influence how these uh, finger joints or how these boards kind of end up becoming having this uh, unique profile. In order to mark up the location of the finger joints, object identification is used to correctly place the template. Uh, here, when the user register a point on the board, the corresponding virtual template is displayed by matching the depth of the user defined point with the, with the ground. And then that way, the virtual template is displayed. Additionally, the virtual template has additional added notation to signify the user the board that they are currently on to help with the navigation of the fabrication process. And then the finger joints are fabricated using an oscillating saw and drill. Um, additionally, object identification can be used to index and coordinate between self-similar parts. So in here, in order to brace the curve foot panel, the tower is actually held together by uh, these six reciprocal steel frames, which has a total of nine unique tube lengths and 54 components, which is a lot of components to kind of track. And object identification is used to identify steel members according to their length by registering two ends at each two, by registering points at the two end of each member. Uh, and then this was specifically used in the coordination, coordination model that is used to display the location of the identified tube steel in relation to the reciprocal steel frame and the tower. And in summary, by using predetermined parameters such as depth and length, object identification can be used to match digital assembly instructions with physical object. Uh, the last uh, series in this paper that um, was introduced as object calibration. And in this th third method, uh, object calibration is used to use for feedback-based fabrication and mixed reality to ensure that the physical assembly actually match up with the digital model. Uh, in the fabrication process, object calibration is employed doing the threaded rod fabrication and panel fabrication. Um, in order to lay out these curve logs into panel, threaded rods with pre-located x nut are used to ensure that each board member is stretched to the correct position. Uh, and to place the hex nut on the threaded rod, a plywood jig with a 3D printed hex nut holder are used. Uh, here, object calibration is used to find the correct spacing on the jig. And when the user pinches the corner of the hex nut holder, the gesture recognition is used to continuously track this movement, thereby obtaining the physical location of the hex nut locator. Uh, as the physical hex nut locator moves closer to the goal, per goal position, the notation would transform from red, yellow to green. And this workflow kind of represents a cybernetic system where there's bi-directional uh, real-time human machine interaction where the adjustment of the physical object would generate new virtual feedback for the user, thus creating a feedback loop until the desired tolerance of three millimeter is attained. And this is just a video of uh, the, the threaded rod being uh, threaded through the jig and screwed through the jig. Um, and then the last uh, part, this uh, using um, object calibration to actually uh, check whether each of the panels are correctly 
uh, align, and this was used more of as a object calibration to check the spacing of each board. And in this process, the physical location of the boards were determined by registering a point at the center of each board. The location is checked against the closest digital board. And the red notation indicates that if the deviation was outside the tolerance, and the green notation kind of represent that uh, this board is all uh, set and ready to go. And by using uh, distances between the physical and digital object as a variable, visual feedback is provided to the user doing fabrication. In this case, object calibration is employed to measure the deviation between physical and digital objects, such as the adjustment of jigs and panel connection. Uh, through gestural recognition, users can now define physical objects in physical space without the tedious placement of a RUPO markers or scanning. Uh, through object identification, users can interact with physical objects to retrieve digital information. And through calibration, object calibration, users can work with real-time feedback loops during fabrication and quality control procedures. Um, so yeah, this was the end of this paper. And moving on to the next paper, uh, this is the last paper that I will be presenting today. Um, and this paper primarily is focusing on more of the design aspect of using mixed reality uh, in addition to the fabrication. Uh, the project is called Active Bending and Physics-Based Mixed Reality. And this was a class project done with uh, Jack Otto, Tuan La, and Leslie Locke. And this is published in ECAD. Oh, wait, I was sharing the wrong slide. Anyway, this is the slide that I was talking about. Um, so yeah, so bamboo is a locally cultivated material available in multiple parts of the world and it has a long history of culture, environmental, structural, and aesthetics context. And it has a great potential for modern building due to its like unique active bending property, but also its cost effectiveness, strength, and carbon sequestration. And this, each species of bamboo also have a unique characteristic, making them suitable for a variety of use stages. And the first goal of this research is to leverage the active bending property through the development of a reconfigurable and modular bamboo system. And second, it addresses challenges in designing with bamboo through a custom physics-based mixed reality environment. And lastly, a mixed reality user interface, which enable users to customize material parameters unique to bamboo. Uh, the challenge is, uh, this is challenging because bamboo is a dimensionally non-standard and structurally dynamic material. As a result, working with physical material is, a physical model is a very common way to learn about bamboo's material property, allowing you to play and experiment with it. And however, when designing with larger projects, this becomes a slow and labor intensive process. Um, so on the other hand, we use digital physics simulation to replicate the materiality of bamboo. And by integrating this digital simulation and physics reality, mixed reality environment, we aim to deliver a tactile experience that is enhanced with uh, machine intelligence. Uh, the mixed reality environment actually allows users to rapidly experiment with virtual bamboo configuration on site using their hands and get immediate digital feedback without expending any real world resources. Uh, the workflow is comprised of an iterative mixed reality design phase and a mixed reality construction phase. And the design phase is centered around a digital working model which has two editing cycles, a module configuration cycle and an automated physics simulation cycle. Um, and the multiple viewing options are also available for the evaluation of the design. And once satisfied that mixed reality projection can be used in the uh, fabrication process. Um, so we will start by introducing uh, the modular system that is also reconfigurable. The system is a kit of part consisting of linear, triangular, tetrahedral, bundle bamboo module, and each module responds to the corresponding base geometry with large bundle at the vertex, which split into smaller actively bent bundles at each edge. And the result is a pretension unit, which is more rigid than unbent rod. Um, 
The bundling strategy is applicable in simulation to higher valence geometries, but through physics testing, we also find these configuration to exceed the bamboo's bending capacity. And then we can also change the different weights of these uh, valence uh, in each valence. And depending on how we load this configuration, you can add distortions that are embedded into um, the module. And so these are the examples of that. And then as for the bundling strategy, we're inspired by traditional latching methods, uh, but also modern techniques such as wire binding, 3D printed brackets, and steel zip ties. And for this specific uh, pavilion, we chose steel zip ties. And for the joinery, we went with a staggered end to create finger joints, allowing for multiple modules to be combined into a more complicated reconfigurable system. So this reconfigurable design is demonstrated through the six modular um, aggregation, which can be assembled flat on the ground and lofted into various configuration. And here's a GIF of that in action with a four module configuration. And the module generation and placement is done during uh, the edit cycle facilitated by a mixed reality interface, uh, which will be further elaborated in this section. Um, as seen in this video, the AR user interface includes a menu for which the user can generate module types. Uh, each of the three types uh, include the linear, triangular, and tetrahedral, and you can bake them. And the annotated module view provides additional information to user of how each module elements are bundled. And once um, satisfied with the condition of like the configuration, the the built-in physics software can be simulated to find the relaxed state of the system with the goals um, embedded in it. And the AR projection allowed the users to evaluate the impacts of the design immediately at a full-scale immersive uh, mode. Uh, this, yeah, and then, and then the, the changes can be made to the model interactively doing simulation. So if you're unhappy with the design, you can add more models, modules or edit or remove existing modules, then uh, continue the physics simulation from which um, you left off. And as for uh, the controls, modules can be grabbed from any part of the mesh or this, uh, or this, uh, this spherical handle that we created. And this basically try to emulate a, a tactile modeling process where uh, the otherwise complex transformation becomes simple gestures just by using hand, uh, the user's hand, and enabling users to orient modules at arbitrary angles without the need of using several digital modeling commands or like gumball tools. Uh, and we also embedded a wide tolerance during this initial setup to accommodate for inherent impositions with gestural recognition. Um, the third part of this is the physics uh, engine and how we incorporate it into the mixed reality environment. Uh, the simulation engine is integrated at two scales. First, at the module scale, which is the generation pipeline, and then second, at the system scale um, with the simulation cycle. So the modules are relaxed prior to being added to the model, and then the simulation includes only the forces within the modules, um, which are then accounted for the majority of the bending in our system. And then once relaxed, this is copied multiple times throughout our model. And this pre-computation basically saves us with the relaxed convergence time when we're simulating in a, in a bigger scale. Uh, for the system scale diagram, simulation at the system scale uh, tunes the model to accurately represent the physical relationship between each of the module and each joint is marked with a specific constraint in mind. So the F marks are free joints that are F3 and they're basically not constrained. And then the J are joint having attraction and tangency, a tangency to uh, the neighboring module. And then the A are anchored and it has an attraction to the ground. So they will be grounded. Um, and th this is kind of like how uh, the system scale uh, simulation kind of results uh, uh, intermodal constraint resulting in a more accurate uh, and informative digital workflow. 
And the critical component of this uh, simulation pipeline is the ability to work in alternation between simulation cycles and the editing cycles. And you can run the simulation, pause it, add new modules or uh, edit existing one, and then continue the simulation. And this feature makes it for a more interactive design uh, experience. Uh, both the uh, render view and the annotated uh, uh, views are useful for the configuration and evaluation of the design, but they can also be used as holographic instruction for the fabrication of the pavilion. Um, the research thus far has focused on the application of physics mix mixed reality as a design tool, but it could also definitely get better as a fabrication procedure. Um, and then the as for the assembly, the projection serves as like a list of required parts, but it also instructs uh, us on where the anchor of the modules are supposed to be in the ground. And once uh, it is used for also the alignment aid for the assembly. And once all the parts are joined, the structure can be lofted into its final aggregation or further arrangement can be explored. Uh, and to session the structure in its form, a two layer secondary system is added and this results in a space frame like structure that could also support a canopy. Uh, and to conclude, uh, the research present a physics-based mixed reality method as a new method for designing with structural dynamic materials such as bamboo and the incorporation of physics engine into the on-site mixed reality design process facilitate the simulation of bamboo's unique active bending property, allowing users to gain insight into the material behavior and also develop more accurate models that are better suited to design. The custom mixed reality user interface has demonstrated the potential for collaborative design um, and also to engage with the material parameters of the bamboo. And while the presented workflow is tailored for one material system, this research uh, offers new opportunities for application of physics-based mixed reality or other structurally dynamic or deployable material system or other simulation-based uh, mixed reality environments. And the active bending and fixes this mixed reality is an iterative design workflow that considers, uh, reconsiders the way we learn, interact, fabricate with structurally dynamic and deployable material system. And this is the end of this uh, research paper and also the concluding of my uh, presentation, um, but with the majority of the work that I presented today basically interface between bridging the gap between the digital and the physical, uh, the human machine, and then how we interact with our physical materiality through basically using augmented reality as um, a medium. And then in each of these projects, there is like a unique factor playing into it. The first project was primarily focusing on the technology and the accuracy of the technology. And then the second method is focusing on the gesture recognition and how we can interact with robots. And then the third method is also using our tactile modeling and modeling in mixed reality, but also how that interface with machine intelligence, such as physics simulation, and also uh, combining that with fabrication procedure. So with that being said, uh, I hope uh, this presentation was informative to everyone watching and hopefully um, get inspired people. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alexander. Beautiful works. <laughs> I think uh, accuracy is the biggest obstacle preventing further development in research for the application of augmented reality in construction scenarios. And uh, you've made significant progress in achieving an average deviation of 0 0.97 millimeters in the fabrication process of glued laminated timber uh, beams. And you have made uh, lots of uh, interesting things such as uh, gesture recognition and human robot uh, collaboration using Fologram. Uh, I have many questions to ask you, but uh, I will ask you later. And now uh, let's move on to Jin Wen Song. Hi, Jin Wen Song. Is your voice okay now? Yeah, sorry for the. Can you hear me right now? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, perfect. So I don't know why it's the device have problem, but I will mm. share my screen now. Oh. Okay.
Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. So, and also sorry about for the diverse problem. And we will have three parts of the whole presentation. And the first one is Crystal will give us small uh, introduction about the BSL lab. And also Dr. Garvin will share some of the mixed reality project in construction. And I will share the development of the database uh, of AR and VR for the architecture design and the production. Uh, and also followed by the presentation by Abdul at the end. Uh, yeah. And this is our team. And this is the video. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Christoph Krola. I am Associate Dean of Special Projects at the University of Hong Kong's Faculty of Architecture. And I'm also an Associate Professor here where I teach in the program Master of Architecture and Design Plus. And I also direct um, the Research Lab, Building Simplexity Lab. Thank you so much for inviting us to talk to you today. Um, unfortunately, I cannot be there in person, but my colleagues will take it from me in a second. So I just wanted to quickly introduce our lab. And just to situate where our work positions itself is, uh, we're, we're situating ourselves in what we call a post-digital architectural context, where the main goal is not to produce digital architecture, but to transcend that and bring it back into a world of praxis, uh, the practice of producing architecture, only this time informed by decades of working with computers. And together with many other colleagues who are trying to bring the digital into reality, um, we are focusing on a subset of that, which we titled Building Simplexity, and the main idea behind building complexity is that we're trying to overcome construction complexities that are often associated with digital design tools uh, through the simplest of means. And what I mean with that is, for example, a very non-standard but digitally optimized form can be very difficult to build. Well, how can we use digital tools as a weapon of choice to make that possible, rooting this work back in a human-centered construction reality, since most of the construction realities are very human-centered? Uh, now, as part of that, um, we try to incorporate form, performance, matter, material systems, and materializations as design drivers from the early stages of design process onwards, with as main goal to expand on the available construction solution spaces. And extended reality tools play a very important role in that. On the one hand, you have virtual reality, which allow you to visualize designs in a one-to-one -one scale very early on, allowing you to assess not just form, but potentially also performance through simulation engines, et cetera. So virtual reality is a very important component of this for us. Augmented reality on the other, si on the other side allows you to bring digital tools and techniques to the construction site by projecting them onto the hands of the people that are materializing your buildings, dramatically changing how we communicate our design processes, and therefore, again, making an expanded construction solution space possible. Now, we have two main missions in our lab. One is to produce innovative research, but also to produce tools for education. Uh, um, and what we're gonna to present to you today is the work that we have done as part of a teaching grant that allowed us to develop a whole series of uh, tutorials related to extended reality. Now, I'll let you, uh, my team present that to you in a bit more detail later. Um, but to first introduce the team that we have working with us. So Dr. Garvin Guppel is a specialist in augmented reality based construction. So he'll show a bit uh, of work related to that topic. And then Abdullah Sheikh and Jingwen Song have been instrumental in producing many of the tutorials on both AR and VR, and they will be uh, showing you those. Uh, Nicole Longhin Wong is working on some very practical uh, research projects uh, dealing with Glulam. Um, so he will have to join us in another session when we discuss the work more. Um, but again, thank you very much for the invite uh, to present our work and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. So actually, is that Garvin has introduced the experience about in construction architecture and in construction. So and also in our lab, we believe the integration of the practical construction experience into our teaching approach. So we got received the three teaching development grant project. So in 2021, actually we got the first TDG grant about the development of the database on the digital tools and technologies from the architecture design and also the building environment, which is the left, uh, left side. And also 
in the uh, 2022, we got the second grant on the development of AR and the VR tutorials for architecture design and the productions, which is uh, our, I will introduce today. And also we will to development the AI tutorials this year. So which is the third grant we have received. So I will to divide this three parts of to introduce. One is the introduction and also the objective of the database and the future plan. So as we know, actually AR is a revolutionary technology that add virtual things to what we see in the physical world. It has been widely used in uh, medicine, education, and also the construction. And also, we are is also to uh, immerse us in computational and also computer generated world, offering a lot of the experience in the various domains. It already have the practical um, applications in such different areas. So, and also a lot of benefits of the IAR and the VR in architecture. And also they can provide architects a deeper understanding of the spatial relationships and also as well as changing their way of thinking and also changing the progress of the design. And also there are three challenges in teaching AR and VR in architecture. The first one is technical devices and also teaching method and also the course contact. Based on these three challenges, we have uh, set three uh, different objectives for them to solve the problem. And uh, the first one is we solve the technical diverse problem and we got the grant to buy different kinds of, like the first the Oculus VR headset and the Holland's headset and the Vario and the different scanning device. And this report can make sure our students have access to the necessary equipment. So this is the small video to introduce the Oculus Quest 2, which is the VR headset developed by the mental uh, platforms. And this is the uh, AR headset developed by the Microsoft and also to uh, put the digital information into the real world. So next, I will introduce the teaching method about the flipped, uh, flipped teaching method. So flipped classroom teaching method, actually. Why, and also some people ask us why you use this method to teach? Because the hardware can easily to borrow by students for their independent uh, work and also the exploration through the pre-recording online course and also outside the classroom is not is not in class and also by removing the repetitive and also introduction teaching the contact from the face-to-face -face learning actually the class time can be freed up by the focus on the pr project specific the problems such as the device problem or coding problem and such and also more sub, uh, specialized also the advanced problem. So this model actually, when we to teach and the test later, so I'll also Abdul will introduce this one. So this model is work well, can, and can uh, increase the teaching effectiveness. And this is the screenshot of the database. Actually this database is access us through in this link. So when you, you can to just enter this link and go to the website and you can find the database by using search the search box actually under extend reality and you click it, you can see the 29 tutorial exercise. And also in this website, you can use the search box to search others topic, different topic, we have different tutorials. And next is the course contact. So this page actually we will introduce first to introduce the structures of the database. The whole of database have divided two part, which is the AR part and which is the VR part. And also we set the contact of each part is from basic to advanced. So for example, you can see the blue box. So it's in the this is the AR tutorial and from one to five actually is the application of two really helpful uh, helpful uh, tools in actual construction, which is the follow and tune build. And also we use these tools in the 
real uh, construction, which is in Garvin's project. And also this tutorial also structured around this, uh, and also it's be solved around the structures and also the constructions issues about our team. And the, such as the position issues and also the image tracking things. And the, in the VR section, we covered two really current current really popular uh, game engine, uh, Unreal Engine and also the Unity Engine. So actually it can be meet different people for different problems and also cover the VR application. And also another thing is the flexible learning. The design of the, the design of and the order of this tutorial are really flexible. For example, the users can have freedom to select a specific characters we, or which they want to learn. And also it's not necessary to start from the beginning. Actually, the database can use as a reference book when you to need some topic. For example, I want to set up the development environment. So I just choose the, uh, the number eight tutorial and to learn it. And also another one is the most, and also is we do some the uh, investigation about the how people can learn, how, how long it will be take to learn a tutorial. So we said each tutorial only take 15 minutes to 20 minutes. It made it easy for user to follow along. It's not too much, maybe half hour or one hour. It's really hard to set it, to learn it and to follow it. And another thing is that we're doing the user-friendly interface. So you can see the right side. Uh, you can see the right side is a software plugin and also the cross files. They are really to link the, to link already linked because when you to click the several links, so you can directly go to the download page. It's much easier for the users. And also you can see the gallery image. The people can. Uh, only see the gallery image can to preview the final final uh, final output when you to after learning this tutorial. And also AR and VR tutorial also to always in always to often evolving devices like the smartphone and the headset. So we always use the skin mirroring software to integrate software the interface display into the tutorial. This one is much helpful when we to get the feedback from the test students, because when they use the smartphone, so they cannot to see if that's correct. And also if they already followed, but if we have this mirroring software, they will see if they already do it correct or not. And another thing is the key part of the Processing is to create a step-by-step -step plan and get hands on the experience in using the software, actually, especially for HoloLens and Android platform. And also this diagram actually is shows the project-based learning teaching approach. So when we to teach the students, we always to, to, uh, to give them a clearly project goal and to get them to go through a whole the pr pr process to make sure everything is fit together smoothly. But for example, these tutorials is covering a range of the export from the from Rhino to Unity and also build an Android application and also to cover a lot of things. So in this way, it's easier for, for users to understand how everything functions and also open up more opportunities for them because they can to have a progress uh, logic and to maybe they want to a creative. So just, they just to change the progress of the different part. And this is the, our future plan, including, uh, including the AR and the VR project uh, based on this database. And also be also to build by our own app to according to AR stuff and all VR stuff and into the research research project. And also I have mentioned before, so we get the second, the third one is to make more artificial intelligence tutorials and also in architecture design and production. And we and we are really welcome to the knowledge sharing about AI stuff. This is, that is, yeah, next part is, should be up to. Yeah, Jingwen, could you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. 
Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and Uh, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and share the whole screen. And I'm also going to go ahead and straight up pull up Garvin's uh, part there. And we'll just go ahead and play Garvin's part first. I think uh, we should have better sound here. Hi, also from my side, I have the pleasure to present you the mixed reality research that we have been doing at the Building Simplexity Lab for the past few years and show you a few of the projects which we have been doing here. My name is Dr. Gavin Goepel. I'm a lecturer and postdoctoral fellow here at Hong Kong University, where I'm specializing in the implementation of augmented reality in architectural design and construction processes. Just to frame our research in this direction a little bit, I'd like to show you this short movie here by Kishi Matsuda from the year 2016, where he already speculated about a world where the physical and digital spaces are merging together in a so-called hyper-reality. And what we see here is actually not too far away from reality, at least from a technical point of view, as our mobile devices are rapidly increasing in computational power by creating the sensory awareness of their surroundings, which will ultimately enable them to create experiences like we can see here that will enhance our reality in extraordinary ways. So we did several projects with the aim to bring this technology now into architecture, always with the claim and always with the um, project, with the prospects, with the aim to actually enhance the architectural design and construction solution space. So here, for example, you can see this very complex shape that we claim would be extremely challenging to build by conventional methods such as 2D drawings, for example. But now um, it's possible to create such shapes, even with non-experts um, such as students, through holographic overlays. We also instructed a workshop for the Cardia Conference 2021, which investigated the aid of holographic instructions for bending active grid shells. A highlight of this workshop was to implement a feedback loop between the as-built structure and the digitally designed model through these small Aruku trackers, which allow us to now compare um, the as-built um, better in order to make better decisions, for example, for the digital simulations. So we deepened um, this knowledge in projects such as for the AA Visiting School in Sao Paulo, which we instructed last year, where we implemented holographic instructions um, for the laying out of a flat grid, which would then later be popped up all through the aid of holographic instructions and without the aid of any 2D drawings. We also implemented um, this feedback loop again uh, that you can see here where every point um, that is tracked is directly represented in our 3D modeling um, software. So we can really see how the on-site material behavior performs in accordance to the actual digital um, simulation parameters. And now we can actually um, fine tune these parameters. So for this project, I would like to show you um, a short movie.
This is a project here which we did a few months ago in March in Bali in collaboration with the Bamboo U organization where we built two of these dormitory structures at their campus. Here we implemented holographic instructions through all the different stages of the construction and fabrication uh, sequence. We even used it before these in order to orient the project uh, in accordance to significant views on site and to make sure that there would be enough space which would allow for the laying out of the flat grid before it would then be popped up into its final shape into this bubble that you can see all through holographic guidelines. A highlight was also the installation of a three-dimensional curve that you can see um, on the bottom which again would be extremely challenging to be done with conventional methods. Another highlight of this workshop was the collaboration with local craftspeople and also with participants who had no prior knowledge in holographic um, assembly sequences, even no prior knowledge in um, AR at all or even in architecture. So this project really showcased that this technology allows participants who don't necessarily are engaged in normal building processes but now are unable to participate in these without any prior um, experience claiming that holographic instructions are potentially um, clearer to understand than conventional 2D drawings. So here you can see the team inside one of these dormitory structures uh, which has currently been finalized in Bali. So here you can see um, the current roof installation. A few months ago in August we went back in order to scale up this idea of a bending active grid shelves uh, which is very similar from the initial approach to the project which I showed you before, just in a much bigger scale now. So again here we used holographic instructions in order to lay out the flat grid on the ground, which would then be popped up this time by a crane all through the guidance of AR instructions. So this project is fairly new, but um, if you would like to see more footage which is coming up in the next weeks, please visit the BSL website for this. So the last project which I would like to show you today has nothing to do with construction or fabrication using AR, but this time actually using AR in order to enhance an architectural installation uh, which was built a few years ago in front of the Hong Kong Museum of Art. So here you can see the physical component of this mixed reality art installation, which is however only truly completed if its digital counterpart is activated. So this digital counterpart um, consists out of digitally animated content out of the museum's permanent collection, which is made vis visible through a custom uh, mobile application. So this project here speculates about this future version of a hyper-reality, about this future version of a potential metaverse and to investigate of how our co-urban city space might react to these digital overlays of how this constant digital presence of holograms potentially might enhance or enrich um, our cityscape. So I hope that these um, few projects which I showed you today could give you a better understanding of what we are currently doing at the building Simplexity Lab in terms of mixed reality integration. If you would like to have more and detailed knowledge about any of these projects, please visit our website. Also, most of these projects are published as journal or conference papers, which you can also find on the BSL website. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Okay, so um, just gonna go ahead and go to, are you still following me? Uh, yes. Well, we and can, can you see the screen? Brilliant. Yes, we can. Okay. So um, just to wrap up, as it's been a pretty uh, sporadic uh, introduction to the BSL Lab, um, we've had uh, an introduction to a couple built and applied uh, applications of AR um, that BSL has done uh, in collaboration with uh, a lot of uh, workshops and also different projects. We've seen uh, my colleague Jingwen Song talking about our website um, which is part of uh, three stages of uh, TDG grants. Um, first in 
just basic tools for Grasshopper, and that's a full range of all the Grasshopper tools and plugins that are freely available. Um, and we have tutorials on those uh, example files and a full work through uh, diagrammatically on each template uh, for those for those Grasshopper files. Uh, we also have the XR um, integration in which I, I uh, and Jingwen uh, also helped to uh, enlist a full extensive tool set uh, with AR and VR and kind of push the boundaries of breaking those into those uh, headsets without uh, just relying on Phologram, uh, though you can see we've also used Phologram in the past. And also uh, the last AI grant that we're trying to, uh, we're, we're adding to now and we're working towards. Uh, but I'm gonna show you two extra projects um, that we did. Uh, this one is the start of a sharing and teaching input session um, at the end of uh, our uh, Masters in Architecture course uh, that we conducted last year uh, that I assisted on uh, that Christoph, uh, Dr. Christoph Kroller was uh, presenting. So uh, if I can just go through here, the project title itself was uh, the uh, FOA, FOA teaching goes holographic and it was the XR integration into studio teaching for the built environment. And its aim and objectives were to explore opportunities from holographic technology integration in built environment teaching specifically, and then learning and research as we have seen in other projects as well. Um, to develop and streamline workflows with common design software environments for their implement implementation, and to distill those into tutorials uh, for these workflows into direct integration for flipped classroom uh, de design studio teaching using um, a sharing platform that we have now developed uh, was on LinkedIn and now we've shifted towards the website. Um, so the whole of the studio agenda itself was what the alternative architecture practice model could be. Um, we would uh, understand how we could evolve design methods and see how we could integrate uh, XR into design representation, notation, and craftsmanship implementation uh, throughout the course. Um, these kind of design and build practice models formed how we shaped uh, the interaction with the students and kind of tried to promote a sense of using these tools in their projects as well. Uh, but we'll I'll just go through and demonstrate uh, how we integrated it into our teaching, uh, mainly in the form of a crit, an end of uh, year crit, um, in which we invited a lot of the teaching staff um, to put on the the judges panel, uh, essentially, to put on a set of HoloLens headsets. And from there, we had a final review set up where, uh, as you can see, we had uh, all the judges there and they were all set up with a uh, set of HoloLens, uh, HoloLens headsets and also a projection screen where the presenter would present. So this was kind of the first stage of this uh, experiment into representation and how we could integrate that into the crit environment. Uh, from there, the presenter would go ahead and present and we'd have a live stream computer going straight uh, from, I believe it was Christoph's headset, to dis uh, display uh, the AR components to the rest of the room um, that was not did not have the privilege of our uh, limited capacity of hardware. Um, and then from there, they were also uh, experiencing, experiencing uh, the table in front of them had a series of AR, uh, AI generated AR image trackers. And so what they could do there is pick up those models and have those augmented reality models with digital content and view those di that digital content. Um, uh, while the person was talking, they were reference models. They could also illustrate process and animation. And we set that up as a kind of representative tool to augment and illustrate really complex parts of their architectural project. Um, furthermore, we also had a VR booth at the back um, in which we uh, asked the students to generate content and uh, then allowed them to experience it as well as the guest critics um, uh, after the presentation was done. And so that had a collaboration of a lot of their uh, data that they had generated and, the, and their models, which into a kind of cross-representational space uh, that really showed them the one-to-one -one scale immersion of their, of their uh, uh, buildings and, uh, and pro project designs. Um, and finally, we had an A1 panel that each student generated, which was also augmented 
uh, uh, by image trackers on a phone app as well. So we had a lot of cross representation so that uh, it allowed uh, passers by to also have an experience of the AR uh, elements without having to go fully integrated into the Crest Critic panel and have an invite essentially. So uh, from that, we have a couple screenshots of people looking at essentially empty placards, but I think uh, I'll go into quickly why how these uh, elements were made and uh, how instrumental they were, and we'll have a couple demonstration videos. So each one had a presentation trigger. Um, so on top of that, the student would present their specific uh, group or individual uh, logo that they had made. Uh, this would then trigger within the app and it would recognize this and trigger their content content to be generated within the app, i.e. load a specific level. And then on that specific level, that would customize uh, the handheld image trackers that we had and would auto assign the content to those, as well as the percent presentation image trackers as well. So that would then auto align their digital content to the actual presentation. And, you can see here that there, that is the kind of software workflow we had with that, uh, well, UI workflow really. Um, and here you can see iterations of all of the different logos that we generated and kind of affected uh, to have a little handle on each person's presentation. Um, from there, I hope this plays, uh, but here you can see an example of us using uh, the image trackers to generate um, different uh, handheld models and it could really start to, the interaction was really quite responsive and allowed us to uh, handle those models um, quite well, as well as uh, generating animations and things like that. Um, for the interest of time, I've only included one example from each, um, but you can see there. Um, so the other element uh, of, of this was the VR component into studio teaching and in, in this little experiment. And um, I uh, helped in collaboration with other colleagues, helped to create a VR booth. I believe this is the promotional video right here. And go ahead and just talk through this. So here you could see we had a holodeck space in which we had a UI in which students could trigger a uh, name associated to their work. And that would load in a HDRI, a high, uh, high, dynamic, uh, high dynamic range image, a uh, copy of their model and also 3D scans that they had generated of their site with uh, the lab's iPads uh, that they had in LiDAR scanning. Here you can see a one-to-one -one scale model, um, but actually it was using a student's physical model that she had made and then imported in. And then we had a little UI system so that people could walk around and kind of continuously move through their, their geometry and also experience the environment uh, that they had made with their architecture and um, kind of represent, and students uh, were quite surprised at the scale that they had uh, proposed really uh, in the educational format. And it kind of uh, enabled a evaluative discussion uh, through the architecture that normally doesn't happen um, and is only read by technical experts. Uh, but with this, uh, people and passers-by, uh, members of the public were able to get a more in-depth uh, understanding of each person's design, specifically with the handheld trackers as well. Um, and as you can see, that that really does follow through for all of the uh, the environments that we made here. I'm just going to skip through because there's uh, quite a few. Um, but here you can also see the demonstration of the students trying out their, their own um, environments as well. Okay. So if I go to the next slide. Here we have um, a little explanation of how that was made. So both applications were developed in Unity, one using Vuforia um, and for image tracking, and also uh, one using uh, the Oculus, uh, well, I believe is the XR Interaction Toolkit uh, to provide uh, VR support for this holodeck. And this is where we customized and labeled all the students' names and this was the old school method, I believe, of having uh, myself uh, placing in all all of the uh, the content and data, but also having the students uh, understand concepts of data types, uh, specific uh, compression rates, uh, textures, uh, all sorts of things that that kind of go with those uh, cross software workflows that are used in the educational 
uh, in this educational kind of a project. Um, so here you can see uh, a little more about the actual UI that was designed um, for that, uh, as well as uh, another project. So uh, that was our first foray into um, the actual representation um, aspect of all of these tools. And we wanted to uh, bleed more of our uh, expertise within the actual uh, courses themselves. So this was another opportunity, which was the um, architectural XR elective for uh, design plus students. And as a result, we had an interdisciplinary um, uh, field of students and also a, a multi uh, gradle uh, array of students. So we really had a, across the years and across the skill sets. And uh, this was uh, a part in which we would teach them VR workflows and kind of uh, customize and respond to student feedback in order to teach them quite technical knowledge about how to integrate VR within their projects and um, kind of speculate on the future of XR. So this was our, my specific part in which I taught, which was the VR component. And here you can see um, a specific class being taught. Um, we had a range of uh, tutorials that Jing Wen earlier men uh, mentioned earlier, uh, such as the Unreal Engine tutorials, in which uh, we teach a set of up-to-date, uh, really quite up-to-date, including Lumen um, and Nanite, all of the uh, custom uh, edge, uh, edge of the uh, top of the range, sorry, uh, technologies. Uh, so here we have a fully enabled uh, scene for Unreal Engine. And we have a virtual reality template for that. So students were then able to use this uh, to customize their own uh, interactions within virtual reality. We had some custom examples and also some custom implementations uh, of everything, really, um, a little bit further than the actual virtual reality template that they normally get. Now, we also had a couple of problems with uh, data transfer again. So we really responded to that and we designed this course to include the NVIDIA Omniverse. So the NVIDIA Omniverse was uh, the result of us keeping our ear to the ground. And during their last uh, major talk and release, they, they talked about this Omniverse um, in which they uh, release it as a cross software architecture and platform in which they have a central noise nucleus, which hosts microservices and supports a range of 3D modeling softwares and also game engines um, and hosts them into instanced um, smaller running softwares. So for example, Omniverse Create and Omniverse View. Um, and this then is centralized through the nucleus, which allows them to have a shared file. And that means that you can have something in Rhino connect all the way through this nucleus to something in Unreal Engine and also host uh, a virtual reality or augmented reality um, through any of those things and also use these little microservices as well. So it was quite a complex uh, tool that we realized was not being used or implemented. So we decided to implement it for this uh, specific elective course. Um, we used specifically the Rhino Omniverse connector and the Unreal Engine Omniverse connector. And so this is a specific plugin that would enable you to send to view or publish your project or export as prop uh, all different data types, but they all have a different centralized server notation. And what that means is, is that it's then published to the Omniverse nucleus. And then from there, it would then go all the way to Unreal Engine. And we could establish a live length of changes from Rhino and Grasshopper all the way to Unreal Engine and view that within uh, virtual reality as well. So here we, we were using all of these software workflows to kind of streamline the educational process and allow us to front load a lot of technical information across both softwares. So from Rhino, all of that optimizing of data, and then all the way to Unreal Engine and all of this new interface where usually we have a lot of trouble with people getting in the front, their foot in the front door um, with, uh, with this. So that's why we use the Omniverse there. Um, so the course itself then implemented on this, we had a simplified task, which would allow us to front load all of this interface of Unreal Engine, all of the uncertainty of this new software, and then an extended task, which would allow people to use uh, virtual reality specifically in this capacity 
though we had other uh, components uh, such as AR and computer vision, um, and then kind of speculate on how that could be used in an extended way there. So uh, here are some results of task one. You can see the virtual reality template, but we already have uh, someone importing uh, the architectural components, and this was a two second uh, import. Um, clearly low effort, but here you can see another uh, another instance of that, people just importing geometry, and here a full material transfer. Furthermore, a, another uh, set of tasks, but here you can see people starting to add custom components, such as water and rocks, and adding specific lights, and you can start to see a level of skill set being developed. Here we have an internal lighting system, and someone implementing the teleportation feature properly. And uh, another lovely internal condition with all the textures mapped correctly, um, which as you don't know, I don't know if you know this, but um, it, it, it sometimes comes across when managing a lot of models through to virtual reality, but all successful um, implementations of task one, allowing people to immediately view their uh, objects and scenes within virtual reality and have control over those scenes in an open manner, rather than just using an end of service platform. Um, further examples. And we get here to now to the extended applications. So this one used a, this was a certain group uh, that used a live link from Grasshopper. Um, and what that did was they allowed them to customize this pavilion and they wanted to understand um, where this pavilion or what this pavilion would do under certain rain conditions. Uh, and so they speculated, uh, let's see and test what it would be like under a specific structure, i.e. the Eiffel Tower here, I believe. And they have used here um, this Omniverse Create XR which allows them to, um, so here's the Omniverse Create on the top left and Omniverse XR on the top right and Grasshopper and Rhino on the respective uh, bottom right and bottom left. So um, what that means there is that they had this service on the top left running their physics simulation in which they could uh, instance uh, small spherical particles or small balls, uh, but instanced by a Grasshopper definition of a populate 3D and then allow it to fall through and simulate collisions in this platform, which is much lighter and allows you for allows you to use that on a, a, a much more lightweight scale and then view that separately on VR, technically splitting um, the workflow, but instancing it for a much faster connection. Um, and here we have another example of uh, this extended application where they had used this for building and massing and had plugged all of that into the programmatic functions and were then transporting this all the way over to the Create and the Create XR uh, platform. And they were using that then to take out elements um, in VR via a grab function. And then the Grasshopper functions there would reassess and reevaluate based on that live connection. And here you can see a little publish of when that is not live and when this is completely live and synced up to the actual geometry there. So of this, we have um, at the BSL lab, we've kind of tried to take apart the technology, um, allow everyone the back end of the HoloLens, as well as um, the Oculus Quest and any of the technologies we have, we have produced a range of applied projects as well as our tutorials there. And really, we invite you all to um, use this um, this website here, bslhku.hku.hk forward slash tutorials. And there you can find a full range, uh, like we've reiterated a thousand times, I'm sure, um, of regular Grasshopper tutorials, our extended reality, tutor reality tutorials, and hopefully coming soon, our augmented real uh, artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence tutorials as well. Um, that is it on my side. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, all right. Thanks a lot, Abdulashik. Thank you for your sharing of the up-to-date uh, outcomes. I have seen many tutorials on the BSL website and find them very helpful. And I recommend everyone to watch the tutorials on the website.
Uh, Thank you very uh, much. Uh, most scholars in the AR field focus on the direction of construction and human robotic collaboration. However, uh, you and uh, Garvin focus on immersive design and exhibition and education. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it's time for uh, our panelists to ask some questions and our audience is also welcome to drop comments and uh, uh, questions. So uh, actually I have one question uh, for Alexander. Uh, so people can have uh, time to think their questions. Uh, in mm -hmm. uh, my, my question is uh, in indoor and uh, multiple QR uh, code scenarios, the accuracy could be very high. However, uh, in real-scale architectural construction scenarios, uh, when operating outdoors, factors such as uh, light influence and a lack of environmental 3D information will have negative impact for HoloLens to perform SLAM for positioning and modeling. Uh, moreover, if there are uh, a thousand components to be installed, it would be uh, require maybe 8,000 QR codes. Uh, so, uh, which uh, entails a massive workload. And uh, what solution do you think could be uh, viable in this situation? Uh, sorry, Alexander, you forget to turn on your uh, microphone. Okay, yeah, I think I was muted. Okay, um, uh, yes. I think it's better. I, I guess the question also have to do mostly with SLAM. Uh, can share my screen again. Um, oh, I don't know if my screen share is working, but I could try to um, show the question. I guess like SLAM kind of influences how like, yeah, outdoor it would work. And this is kind of most of our experiments or like half of our experiments where we're around indoor and mostly in factory environments where the a lot of the control environments are controlled. We have a lot of control over that, um, but I agree, like if we are working outdoor construction sites, like that, those are very varied uh, changes over day and night. Um, so that's something of like a difficulty with SLAM. And it's something that would be very hard to resolve until uh, you kind of, um, the solutions that I kind of have seen people done before is basically they put like some kind of roof or like some kind of tarp uh, to kind of like, or like some kind of wall system in the construction site to control the lighting conditions and to make sure that there isn't harsh sunlight or there's enough light. So they would either, if, if you're working in the evening, you would bring in lights to make sure that there's some light um, in the objects that you're working with or uh, add like some kind of roof structure or work underneath the canopy to ensure that um, the registration is not affected by sunlight as much. Uh, as for the other question with the uh, QR codes, I think uh, adding multiple QR codes is it is problematic. Uh, we we kind of went up until adding like um, eight QR codes on a glue lamp beam. Uh, obviously, that didn't increase the accuracy as much from our results. But uh, the alternative method that we kind of worked, uh, knowing that this is like not something that everybody wants to do, adding like a lot of million. QR codes on all their work objects. So the alternative uh, idea that we introduced was basically using a grid system. So you could kind of imagine a factory floor with a grid of QR codes that would be permanently there. So, so that you can like build large scale things and then keep the QR codes the same and never have to change the QR code. So if you're sure of like, if you're sure that you're gonna work in the one location, then yes, you can set up like the use the frame, uh, the template method to kind of put QR codes in a in a grid manner. But if you're sure that you're working in this work object and you'll be work moving this work object a lot, then uh, the strip method would be like a better uh, example of it. But still the method entails using multiple QR codes to improve the accuracy. So we will have to kind of use uh, a little bit of a lot of like or like a, a number of QR codes, but then uh, that can be greatly reduced by the kind of workflow that you choose to make. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, another question. If I buy a hologram, uh, I don't think the hologram can do the same things you did 
And so uh, what is the value of a phonogram? I think even if I have phonogram, I will be confused with the basic knowledge uh, about uh, augmented reality. And uh, if someone wants to build a software like a phonogram from scratch, I think uh, he will learn more about augmented reality. So what is your opinion about this? Wait, so what, what's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the question is, um, I think even if I have a phonogram to use, but uh, I'm will be confused with the basic knowledge about augmented reality. Um, I I don't think I can do the same thing as you did, such as a uh, uh, gesture recognition and uh, uh, the human robot uh, collaboration and stuff, and so. And um, what do you think uh, I should uh, start to learn or something like this? I see. Um, um, I, yeah, I guess, yeah, I think the research was, I guess, yeah, the goal, some of our projects, specifically the gesture recognition project, I guess, like, with the robot, like, that requires a lot of setup already. Someone to have, like, a knowledge of, like, gesture recognitions and also have access to a robotic uh, arm. There's a lot of question with access. Um, that 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 project doesn't really tackle, but I think that project was kind of more about pushing the boundaries between what we can actually do. Uh, but in terms of access, I think um, before one starts with like a a Hololens or like a head mounted display, which also have like barrier and like uh, money to buy the headset, uh, I I I would recommend one to start with like a mobile device and then kind of build off that and then like phonogram is free for mobile and then kind of learn through that um learn through that first before uh I, I guess like uh knowing what you exactly want to do and what to what to want to explore but yeah augmented reality uh in a way it's like cheaper than robotic arms to like if you want to fabricate something that's customized you can kind of achieve like the same kind of uh, I guess, like, outcomes without needing to get a robotic arm. But I guess if you want to also collaborate with robots, like, that's also a medium to do. So I think questions about access is a very important um, thing to address. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I have another question for uh, Adubla uh, Sheikh. And uh, my question is, uh, is it possible for uh, VR devices to replace computers in the future and becoming the choice for most uh, uh, designers to, to use. And what is the reason that uh, prevents VR devices from be becoming popular at, at this moment? Is it due to the device pricing or something? Uh, okay, so that's a great question. I think um, designers uh, use whatever notational tool that they can get um essentially um and as you can see we started with hand drawings and we moved to CAD and CAM uh essentially we have a lot of ways of representation increasing the amount that we're immersed in our digital content is a huge way in which designers can understand what it is they're designing the impact of their moves um within the design and kind of analyze their own work that's self-referential system is 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 kind of an integral component to AR or VR. It, essentially, it's just your surroundings and whether you're aware of them. Um, as a second part to that question, I think it's a problem with the technology right now. So um, the lab has a lot of quests, um, quest twos, and the quest twos are great because uh, the actual processor on them is very small they're basically a mobile phone it's like a snapdragon a qualcomm um and then on top of that uh it, it performs slam uh like the rest of it and due to even uh the the actual safety guidelines for the eu and all of that it has to have um augmented reality in it so there you already have something that's cheaper than a hololens can perform augmented reality has access to simultaneous localization and mapping um, and now we're seeing two new headsets come up. I mean, three, I guess. Uh, you can either the MetaQuest 3 or the MetaQuest Pro, um, and then the Apple Vision headset with Vision OS as well. And um, all of those, all of those APIs, all of the uh, software behind it 
is all supported for Unity and Unreal Engine. So another plug, but uh, please go and use the tutorials on our website. I mean, uh, they absolutely back into all of these uh, devices. Uh, and uh, the more we increase knowledge, and now when the technology catches up, we will absolutely have experience with these notational tools and I guess become better designers, hopefully. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so next, um, maybe Sunying Wang, our associate professor from Suzhou University. I'm aware that you also have great experience in augmented reality and uh, timber fabrication and you have published uh, many papers. So do you have any ideas you'd like to share with us or any questions from your perspective? Sure, uh, can you hear me, All right? Can yes, me? we can hear you. Uh, yeah, uh, so actually it's funny because when you came to me, actually I was Christoph's student. I was his PhD student from 2015 and 19. Actually I met Abdul and Jim in the office. And of course oh. I, I know uh, uh, Garvin a uh, long way back. So that's why, I mean, uh, my research, of course, is also in augmented and uh, digital fabrication in this domain. It's basically, we are, actually, uh, me now actually is operating in the same domain, actually similar to Christoph. Of course, we're on under, a, you know, a same, similar, I would say, uh, theoretical background, which is building simplexity. And, you know, what I call it is an exact architecture, which means you human are not that precise or not that exact, but machine is more, you know, complex and exact. But uh, I would say it's more like a discussion, not a questions about for you guys, for Alexander and Abdul and Jimin. I think my my questions would be like, what's next? I mean, instead of, you know, uh, how and what, because we're now actually just using, you know, uh, mixed reality for, you know, digital registration or holographic instructions for human. Uh, we're trying to make uh, I would say human more machine like, um, because we want human to you know to accommodate the capacity of either hollow lines or robotic arms or you know whatever machine we're using. But what's next? Can we? Are we? Or are we going to make you know machine more you know human like? Are we going to integrate you know the 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 ambiguity of human operation either in construction or design that can you know through mixed reality can we you know uh, make it easier or to, to cooperate with machine or do you think architectural design itself, you know, in the future, or let's say uh, building details or, you know, even building systems will change to accommodate these technologies. That would be my, you know, questions or probably a discussion for you guys. Maybe Alexander, do you, you have any? I could, I could comment? start, I could start by, yeah. I guess, addressing this question with um more like the the bamboo project that i kind of did um specifically um working with um the design process is i think where most of like this idea of collaborating with machine could um be implemented this uh feedback between the machine and then the human because uh in my opinion uh there's like machine intelligence and human intelligence. And then there's like the creativity part that you could talk between and kind of having the machine feedback in our simulation and kind of, this is basically a purely design project. We're just using XR to kind of uh, enhance human design decisions and then help them kind of like make decisions. And I know a lot of uh, AR project, it's kind of more like you instruct like the design that is a, the fabricator what to do and you, the fabricator becomes just like the human hand just becomes like a robotic arm in some sense in a lot of like augmented reality fabrication projects where you're just replacing the human with the robotic arm um, through AR. But in, in this project particular, we kind of want to assist in the design process and how, how physics simulation is something that is within like um like a rhino environment or like a laptop environment and then to move things around you kind of have to like use like commands such as like um commands such as like i guess like uh move command and transform rotate commands but the idea here is that by using mixed reality we can get closer to the the more natural and intuitive way that we used to make and design things so making making things with our hands like if you make like a model for example like 
way before like digital model, the digital modeling tool exists. We use physical modeling tools, but then I think the future, in my opinion, would be how can we bridge the machine intelligence, but also actually use technology to actually go back to the more creative and like natural way that we have been modeling before technology existed. So in my opinion, I think the future is actually using technology to actually go back to, to the more human ways of that we design and more hands-on tactile and immerse, or, or I guess like more physical making, but then also it's enhanced through digital and machine intelligence. So that would be That's, my answer. Yeah. Good. Um, do you mind if I tack on a little bit to that? Is that, is that all right? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a fantastic answer, and I kind of want to mirror it a little bit. Um, in in uh, and Alexander, com commendations on your on your project. I think in what's exemplary about your project as well is you kind of start to use the technology and break the technology a little bit with your hand tracking and things like that um, in order to assist with the design process and also assist with the fabrication process. And I think that's this kind of integral component that we need to think about, which is taking the technology and not being bound by it, but also kind of using that in our model making and problem making, uh, problem solving kind of workflow and treating that as a tool that can be implemented, re-implemented, um, change our understanding of how we're designing. And um, again, it, it shouldn't just be about one specific technique, right? I, I really want to stress the visual impact of these things. There's a reason why AR is a lot more accepted within architecture. You have the visual impact of your surroundings and then your digital content on top, right? So we, we kind of have to understand the power of what we're using and, and, and really, really start to probe it as its own design tool as well and kind of break it apart and see how what it can do for us as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say I, I would agree with you both. And probably the uh, I got another question, just a quick question, probably for Abdu and Jinwen, because I, I know you guys have been teaching, you know, or integrating XR technology, extended reality in, in master studios. I think that's most Christoph is working on. Uh, I was just wondering, because I'm here in Suzhou University, actually I'm teaching undergraduate studios, which, you know, uh, I think either in Hong Kong, in, in, in mainland China is the same. Like we also, you know, we, we always, uh, stick to the, I would say, conventional pedagogical strategy, which, you know, we, we teach you, you know, forms of follows function or, you know, uh, modernism building. So I think, do you think, you know, you, uh, the experimental studios you get, you guys have been working on uh, in, in HKU or in other domain, can, do you think it can brought to, uh, do you think you can bring it to or uh, undergraduate studies, even for, you know, probably year two or, you know, year one? Do you think that can be integrated? My question would be how you think, how you see this technology can be integrated with undergraduate study or undergraduate education? So I think um, with with the example of that, we can, we can use uh, the design representation um, kind of uh, template that we did. And there we, we had it open to students as a representational tool, but we, we kind of allowed them to just be front faced to the you have to give us these files and we'll load them into content. Um, I think developing uh, workflow specific um, methods in which we could import that content, um, designing courses around that, and then really the tutorials were born out of that, which is the the idea that the students could front load this kind of uh, hard technical information and then um, use that creative within their projects to 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 do that these students are possibly the best i believe they're technological natives they're consider consistently immersed in technology they they shouldn't shy away from it at all so um you know it, it's just a matter of them being able to reference this highly technical data um with quite guided tutorials um while they're away and, and like jingwen um can obviously speak about the flipped classroom nature of things as well, if she wants to. Oh, yeah. And also when we actually, we have the, also in the first master, master studio and also have including the undergraduate job student, uh, undergraduate students. So actually, and also you can see the tutorials on the website, actually this is the version, version, version three, 
we already built the first version and second version, and this is the version three. So we have the test student to test the whole about all of the tutorial. And also we get a really, the really meaningful and also really good feedback is that when they to do the tutorial. So that is why we to highlight the workflow is much important. So that is at the, my presentation, we should to let them know from the Rhino and also put into Unity and also at the end of the day first. So they can use to connect, continue to learn how the progress is also even for the master and also the and also the undergraduate student. And also they can, the, and also undergraduate students, they already know the logic and also the design progress. But if we can to put it uh, technology on the end of this. So actually they can to get the feedback and also they can rethink about the design progress on it. So, so actually, so when we to build all of the tutorials, so we can to according to also based on AR because AR is already to connect, already connect to the, uh, to the uh, construction part. And we all to do the, do the service about this and also is more focused on the construction. And also the VR part actually is much about the virtualization. So that is, we put more focus on that. So, yeah, so, and also um, I think teaching and all teaching in the VR and the AR stuff is we should to also see the boundary and also control the boundary, how we can to give their technology because VR and the AR, they have, especially they have the uh, major in VR and AR but we should to know what exactly in architecture we can use. Yeah, that is my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's uh, that's good uh, for my part. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we have Xi Liu Yang as a research associate at the uh, ICD, who has developed a, a impressive software okay. named okay. Visor, which is in the field of uh, human robotic collaboration. And I believe you will provide some ideas or raise some questions in your perspective. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. Yes, so I work mostly with AR in the context of human robot collaboration. Um, and one aspect of it is also kind of holographic instructions that you give to the person to instruct how to build a piece or um, to be informed of like state of the robotic system. So I have a question to all of the speakers, I think regarding on this um, topic of communication. So when you immerse a person, whether it's AR or VR in this digital environment, you facilitate kind of their communication with digital information, but what about their communication with people around them, right? So let's say in the review scenario, you have um, normally people sitting in a room um, that's looking at the same poster, that is looking at the same object, and they can have a discussion about that. When you detach this, how do you maintain like the same sort of communication? Or in the construction scenario, where most of the time it's a team activity, right? There are people who can see the AR instruction and there are people who cannot. How do you mediate this communication between, between them? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I personally, I think it, uh, it starts to spark a couple interesting discussions. Um, usually ones of checking. Um, I think this looks right. This doesn't look right to me. Um, all sorts of those things. But um, I, just in the educational format, we, we found, um, allowing the students to import animation data uh, gave them ways in which to express their project that they would not normally have done, and they tried to you know, it, it, it becomes this exercise in trying to represent yourself rather than actually kind of develop the develop, uh, development of your design. Um, so it, it really starts this um, quirk of interface and, and, and kind of switching and relating data of I see this, what do you see, uh, what are you seeing there, um, which are fascinating conversations and uh, specifically for the coming uh, tools we have with uh, UI and, uh, you know, facial recognition, all of those things in the metaverse, um, hopefully we'll add those to the tutorials as well and we'll, we'll integrate those as uh, as tools we can use. Yeah. yeah, I think there's like this term called like AR coordinator, which is like the person with the AR headset basically coordinating everyone else. Uh, but um, 
that's like one approach, but also like the other, yeah, the AR coordinator basically does like get the instruction, but also I think it's important for them to have like a quality control procedure kind of to ensure that what they're coordinating and telling other people is actually followed through and then actually checking if that like what it, because technically they're just verbally coordinating back to other people of what they're seeing visually so I think the important thing is incorporating those feedback loops again and double checking uh, and making sure that through a quality control procedure that you know whatever the coordination is actually gets followed through so that there's no there's less miscommunication I guess. So actually, uh, for Alexander, for the studies that you showed, both with Gulam and the one with Bamboo, um, are people like are everyone who are participating in the construction wearing the headset? So I, everyone. So it's usually just two people. I don't think we have tested more than two Hololens at the same time. So usually, two people would be wearing the Hololens and and kind of engaging with the process. Um, so I think comparing this situation to like, so Gavin's not here, but like in his um, video, he shows these collective bamboo construction situations where there are dozens of people around. And I'm always really curious, you know, when you scale up the number of people, how does this start to work? Um, like, and this is also something that we're kind of trying to explore. If we have multiple people in the construction team with the robot, how do you have an interface that kind of best facilitate this sort of coordination and um, communication? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure there's there's a lot of um, stories Garvin could tell about uh, managing between that, but I think it is that it's managing. And, and like Alexander said, there's probably an AR coordinator on that. Um, from references of what Garvin's told me, I believe it's a couple main HoloLenses on site, and then a lot of people having their phones connected or, or, or other situations in, in which people can kind of understand the references of the main person, you know, um, relating that. But I think it, it brings up a more important question, which is we're kind of at this stage then letting the interaction be dictated by the technology um, in which we have this one calibration point and one anchor point, um, be it a set of QR codes um, within the AR space. So. Uh, I, I really honestly believe that um, as the interaction, as the technology develops, as as um, we use other tracking methods, as with these interaction methods develop, we may, you know, come across um, voting methods, uh, different tracking methods, collaborative models, all these digital twins and synthesis of data. You know, that there's all many ways in which AR could, you know, take the next step. Yeah, I think a part of it is also like a limitation on headsets because this is a very, you know, one person sees compared to other yeah. AR medium like iPads or projectors where it is a shared medium. I think um, it affords certain things. It also takes away certain things. Like a lot of these gesture-based um, uh, systems, like Alex, your work, I think it shows a really nice range of how you can use that as an input and also as a way to interact. Um, I just wonder once you kind of, if this is still possible without headsets, in the equation so you can have the best of both worlds you know you can have this tactile natural interaction but still have a shared medium where everyone can um, be informed okay uh, so uh, i think uh, we have a wonderful and meaningful lecture today and uh as we uh, near the end of our event, uh, I'd like to express gratitude to our guest speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. Before we say goodbye, I also would like to give my sincere thanks to all of the panelists for making today's session so meaningful. Uh, it's been a pleasure hosting this event. Please stay connected with us uh, the recording uh, will be uploaded to YouTube and Bilibili as soon as possible. And finally, uh, on behalf of uh, Architectural Digital Futures, I extend my warmest thanks to you all and uh, see you next time. Bye. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Uh, good thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.